Hello. Good evening, and welcome to tonight's lecture featuring Dr. Temple Grandin. My name is Claire Barnett, and I'm a third year student graduating this May with a degree in human and organizational development. I'm here to introduce the host for tonight's event, Chancellor Nicholas S. Zeppos. Chancellor Zeppos was named Vanderbilt's eighth chancellor in March of 2008. Since 1987, Chancellor Zeppos has been an active contributor to the university, beginning with his role as an assistant professor in the law school. A noted legal scholar, teacher, and executive, he has focused Vanderbilt on its core missions of teaching and research, and he has personally recruited a, signif a significant number of its world-class faculty. Please join me in welcoming Chancellor Zeppos to the stage. Well, thank you so much, Claire, for that kind introduction, and thanks all you do to educate the Vanderbilt community and move us forward. Uh, good evening and welcome to tonight's lecture. Uh, tonight, we are thrilled, thrilled to come together to learn from Dr. Temple Grandin, one of the brightest luminaries in the field of autism. Tonight's event, of course, is part of a long and distinguished commitment of our University of Vanderbilt to expanding knowledge and awareness of autism and autism spectrum disorder. From Triad, the Treatment and Research Institute for Autism Spectrum Disorders at the Vanderbilt Kennedy Center to the many researchers and practitioners across the campus and the medical center that have dedicated themselves to understanding, assessing, in caring for individuals with autism and their families. Vanderbilt, as you know, in this area, is dedicated to advancing knowledge and changing the world in this important, critical area. I'd like to also take a moment to honor Jennifer and Billy Frist, who unfortunately could not be with us tonight. Their generosity has allowed, allowed us to endow the new interdisciplinary Frist Center for Autism in Innovation, which is focused on supporting and developing the neurodiverse talents of individuals with autism. We are so grateful for the Frist's significant contribution and involvement with this important topic. I would also like to thank everyone who was involved, either as an organizer or an attendee, with the conference sponsored by the Frist Center and the Vanderbilt Kennedy Center that culminates with tonight's lecture. So thank you to so many people who contributed to this extraordinary day and this great visit. Now, I am privileged to introduce Dr. Temple Grandin. Dr. Grandin is a world-renowned author, inventor, and spokesperson about autism spectrum. Born at a time when a person with autism was often institutionalized, Dr. Grandin overcame discrimination and hostility, and she bucked the expectations to pursue her academic interests, to pursue and earn multiple degrees in psychology and animal science while becoming a highly regarded scholar and leader in the field of animal science. As her career progressed, Dr. Grandin became a prominent author and speaker on both autism and, interestingly, animal behavior. She is a professor of animal science. She's been a professor of animal science at Colorado State University and a consultant on livestock equipment design. Her, book, her many books include Thinking in Pictures, The Autistic Brain, Thinking Across the Spectrum, and most recently, Calling All Minds, How to Think and Create Like an Inventor. Dr. Grandin's influence spans from far and wide. In addition to her appearances, in national and international media outlets, HBO also made a wonderful Emmy Award winning movie about her life in 2010. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Temple Grandin to the stage. Someone like Vance got my slides kind of changed around there. Uh, really good to be here today. There's a picture of me teaching my class. And 
autism is an important part of who I am. And I wouldn't want to snap my fingers and not be autistic because I like the logical way that I think. But being a professor and working in the cattle industry comes first. I think it's so important to have a good career. And a question that often comes up is, how did I get interested in the cattle industry? I was exposed to it in high school and college. This is why I emphasize so much that students need to get out and do internships. Now, on the milder end of the spectrum, where people remain fully verbal, it's uh, just part of normal variation. You know, people with autism have more relatives in technical careers. There's a very interesting article that just came out in 2018 called Genomic Trade-Offs are autism and schizophrenia, the steep price for a human brain. The same genes that make our brain big are the same genes that cause autism and schizophrenia. So you can't totally get rid of it. Another mind-blowing paper is solitary mammals as a model for autism. You can look that up. Lions are more social than panthers. Does that mean panthers are defective? No. But the problem we got now with the spectrum is it's such a big spectrum and it's going all the way from Silicon Valley scientist to somebody who can't dress themselves. And people are getting too locked into the label. Thomas Edison was a hyperactive adult high school dropout. I'm pretty sure he'd be autistic today. And how about Einstein? No speech until age three. He'd be in the special ed department and labeled autistic. And uh, how about Steve Jobs? He was a weird loner who'd bring snakes to school and turn them loose. He was bullied and teased in school. Well, I think he's done pretty well for himself. Now, I had a wonderful trip to NASA last year. And that's a launch pad they're building for the NASA Mars trip. And what I learned when I went to NASA is the right stuff rode the rockets. But the geeks and the misfits and the people with the labels built the stuff. And I am saying that absolutely seriously. There's a person with Tourette's that's working on it right now another person that's very severely dyslexic working on it. And as I go back and forth between the autism world and places like NASA, also the livestock industry, I worked with a lot of skilled tradespeople that I were probably dyslexic or on the spectrum, and they're retiring and not getting replaced. We're losing our skilled trades. One of the worst things the schools have done is taking those things out. They're all careers that are not gonna get replaced by computers. Now, I've got emotions, but I get emotional when I think about knowledge. And I got really emotional reading an article about 80, he's now 82-year-old Ed Stone, who is still at mission control for the Voyager spacecraft 40-some years later. And they've lost all the funding. They're now in the storefront next to the puppy training center in the McDonald's. And he's seeking knowledge. Find out why we're a Class M planet. You have to be a Star Trek to know what that is went by Saturn on the way, and they get all the other misfits that are running these big radio telescopes to bootleg some time so they can pull in that weak signal. It's searching for knowledge. And there was an article about this in the New York Times Magazine, and I cried for the entire flight that I read this. This was something that made me get really emotional. And there's my NASA geek out. I got to sit in the original launch director's chair. That's about as close as I'm gonna get to these sort of things. And I got to thinking about what our generation did at NASA. I mean, it was really super special. You know, it's too bad that some of those things aren't going on so much today, but private industry is taking it over. But don't get hung up on the labels. Just don't get hung up on it. It's not precise. Tuberculosis is the precise diagnosis, but they keep changing the label for autism. They took the Asperger's out in, in the early 90s. So now you no longer have to have speech delay to be um, autistic. You know, the Asperger's is all in there. So now you've got brilliant people that can become brilliant AI scientists mixed in with uh, people that can't dress themselves. And I'm seeing too many smart kids being held back. They're not developing the strength. We need to be building more on what the student's strength is. If there's a little third grader that's good at math, then give them the harder math books. And I talked to a lot of low-income families, and cost is an issue. You can pick up good books for $9 on Amazon, and there's lots of good free stuff online. I've had a lot of grandparents come up to me in the last couple of years, and they're finding out that they were on the spectrum when the grandkids get diagnosed. So why does granddaddy have a job or grandmother have a job? Because they had paper routes at age 11. They learned 
how to work. And one of the big issues is transitions. I know how to deal with the transitions in high school. Let's learn how to keep a job and work before they graduate from high school. There are students in college that have done just great in college, but they never learn how to hold a job, and then they just crash when they get out of college. No, we've got to work on the transitioning to work while they're still in college so they can be successful when they get out. Well, too many kids don't get to do the fun stuff anymore. In fact, I wanted to be a biomedical engineer, but I couldn't do algebra. And I'm going to talk later on why you need us visual thinkers, the art side of engineering. Let's look at the iPhone. Steve Jobs was an artist. That's why you don't need a PhD in engineering to use your phone. And then the engineers, they got to make the inside of that phone work. And I got to go inside the vehicle assembly building. And I got to go on top of it. And then I found out later on I wasn't supposed to go on top of it, but it's really cool. <laughs> yeah, like that very much. Some basic principles. Sudden surprises scare. Now, both as young kids and as older students, you got to keep stretching them. Don't let them become recluses in a room. And we've got to limit the video games. Kids that are getting addicted to video games, they're going nowhere. They're not going into the video game industry. They're just going nowhere then, play video games in the basement. But you've got to keep teaching them. Give them choices of interesting activities to replace video games. Good teachers, I'm going to go rush through the childhood stuff. Early intervention is super important. I think we're going to concentrate tonight on the older kids. Little kids have to learn how to wait and take turns. Because then when you grow up, you learn how you have to wait and take turns in doing activities. OK, when there's a mistake made, like let's say even in college, and they're eating the mashed potatoes with their fingers, and it's beyond disgusting, we need to be just direct and say, use the fork. There's a scene in the HBO movie where my boss slams down the deodorant and says, you stink, use it. That scene happened. And his secretaries took me shopping. It's OK to be eccentric, but you can't be a filthy, dirty slob. You just have simply got to clean it up. It's just that simple. Keep stretching them. No surprises. You know, little kids always give them a chance to use their language. Sometimes they're slow to respond. We've got to limit those video games. And give the student or the kid choices. You could do this or you could do that. Let's say you've got a video game addict. Well, you could do this class or that class. And if you've got a video game addict in the dorm, we need to go drag him out of the dorm. I know because of stupid administrative rules. And every time I look at the periodic table of the chart, the periodic elements, I think of administratium, the heaviest element discovered by science. <laughs> and it reacts with absolutely nothing because it's inert. <laughs> that is administratium. And administratium prevents the counseling department from going out and dragging the kid out of the dorm. But students and professors, they need to get over there and drag the kid out of the dorm. No, we got, can't let them just stay in dorm playing video games all day. Sensory problems are real. Top area for research in autism is figuring out treatments for sensory issues. Now, oftentimes they're better tolerated if the person initiates them themselves. If you're wearing headphones to block out the sound, Try not to wear them all the time. You wear them all the time, it gets more sensitive. What's important is having control. Then maybe you can get to tolerate some of these sounds. Sensory problems are a core primary characteristic of autism. And to study these things and study them successfully, we need to be not using autism diagnosis as the way to study them, but the particular sensory problem. Like one person might see the print jiggle on the page. Another person can't stand bright light. Another person can't stand noise. Another person has touch sensitivity. Work on studying the specific sensory problem that they have, because we need to find ways to desensitize these things and treat them. When I was a little kid, they tested my hearing. I passed an auditory test, but I did not hear auditory detail. I had some auditory processing problems, and when the grown-ups talked too fast, everything just went into complete gibberish. Slow down, slow down. Give them time to process. And then you got the kid that's echolalic who will eventually learn how to understand words even though he knows how to blab them out, but he doesn't know what they mean. So you've got to teach him what the words mean. Attention, shifting, slowness, and problems with working memory. This is universal. 
You absolutely cannot load working memory. Multitasking is really hard. I was in the AI class, and they had these uh, pattern kind of puzzles. And as soon as you load working memory, I'm in trouble. Now, if I can do those puzzles with actual pieces of cardboard that I can move around, I can do them just fine. Because then that doesn't load working memory. I just can't. Um, I can play videos in my head. And when I first went into a huge, big meatpacking plant, I thought, this place is so complicated. How does the manager even understand it? But then after going over there for a whole bunch of Tuesday afternoons, I finally videotaped the whole thing into my head. Tension shifting slowness. It takes longer to shift back and forth between two different stimuli. Look at how many times the yellow line is looking back and forth between the two eyes in the movie. And you've got to give them time to respond. And I was a little, when I was five years old, I got super, super frustrated because um, I knew that um, uh, we called suitcases bags in my house. And the teacher didn't give me time to explain that it was a bag, and I did know the letter B. Now, there's some individuals where words break up on the page, and they get a visual processing problem where it's almost like migraine headache symptoms, where images break up. Imagine if that's the way you saw things, especially when you got tired. Now, I don't have this problem. This is where the sensory issues are extremely variable. So one individual has these problems, and another one doesn't. Now, a signs of visual processing problems are individuals who absolutely hate escalators. They can't tell how to get on and off of them. They'll see the print jiggle on the page, and the eye exam may be normal. This is what the writing may look like. And sometimes a very simple accommodation will work of printing the homework on tan, gray, lavender, light green. Just try all the different pastel papers. Sometimes that helps. Or try cutting a slot in a piece of cardboard and moving it down the book. Sometimes some very simple things will help. Now, people that have extreme sensory issues have to exert tremendous amount of effort to screen out the noise. And when they get tired, it gets worse. And there are some people that are going to need to take breaks where they can calm down. My problem now with the sound sensitivity is mainly that if it's in a noisy restaurant, I simply can't hear. It makes me functionally deaf. I can tolerate it, but it's pretty hard to be social when you can't hear what's being said. But sensory issues are very, very variable, and a lot of people that remain nonverbal uh, have extreme sensory problems. Now, here's a method that actually worked up to 10-year-old children. It hasn't been tried in adults. You stimulate two different senses at the same time, like maybe you smell cinnamon aromatherapy, and touch a cold water bottle. So it's two senses at the same time being stimulated. This is evidence-based, and it's helpful, and it's also really inexpensive to do. And here are the key words you need, autism, environmental enrichment. You can look it up online. Now, if you're working with individuals that remain nonverbal, here's a reading list of really good books. These are people that type independently, and they describe a sensory disordered world. Now, we need to be looking at some of the milder personality differences, sort of like a music mixing board. Again, the brain can be more thinking, or the brain can be more emotional. At what point is something an abnormality? When you hear a word, you see a word, speak a word, or you think about a word, different parts of the brain turn on. And where the abnormalities are is in the inter-office communications between the different parts of the brain. There's my head, there's my exome, you can see the little tiny threads there. It's a single axons that connect up different parts of the brain, cable bundles. Oh, and it's really pretty when you take my ugly head off of that. <laughs> and here's a cable bundle for speak what you see. That's a normal one, that's mine. Lots of extra, extra bushes. That might explain why I'm a visual thinker, but I paid a price for that. If you count the number of fibers for speak what you see, I've got fewer fibers. And maybe this is why having a lot of speech therapy helped me on getting my speech out. Now, I did these scans with uh, Walter Schneider the, at the University of Pittsburgh, and nobody's picked up on this. Maybe it's a turf battle between the psychiatrists and the neuroscientists. And I'm definitely not an auditory person. That's my speak what you hear. Not an auditory person. Now, this is a picture of a young kid um, 
grew when they were nine years old. Develop the strengths. Strengths in things like art or math or music will often show up around third grade, nine years old. Build on the strength, on the thing that the kid is good at. Because what's been learned is extra circuits grow back here, maybe for math, music, or art. Then we leave out some social circuits. And we put in geek circuits. That's kind of basically what happens. My ability in art was always encouraged. And my mother would encourage me to do lots of different art. Because I used to just do one old horse head all the time. And she encouraged me to draw the whole horse, draw its stable, draw its saddle, draw where you ride it to. Build on the area of strength. And this is a picture a young man sent to me to show how he has movies in his head. This is how I think. When I was in my 20s, I thought everybody had movies in their head. I didn't know my thinking was different. It's been a long, gradual process of learning how my thinking is different. Now, in my animal work, I noticed visual detail. And I watched students on our campus last year walk over these eclipse shadows from a tree. This is right in front of our library. They didn't see it. I noticed a lot of little things that the cattle saw. And other people seem to not notice it. There's some evidence now <coughs> that some of these kids have better pitch discrimination. Now, visual thinking was an asset to someone designing facilities because I could visualize it. But you have to work on training it. It took me about three years to learn how to read blueprints. Learning how to draw them kind of came magically, but I had to learn to read them. I had to learn that a square on a floor plan was a concrete column that held up the roof. And the way I learned that was to walk around in the Swift meat packing plant in Arizona back in the early 70s with the floor plans until I could locate every line on the drawing related back to the equipment. And I loved the fact that the movie recreated all my projects. And they're starting my career in construction. And I've learned a lot of things in construction. There's an urgency. You've got to get it done. I talked to a lot of parents. I got a smart kid. That kid might be 16 years old, and he's never learned to shop. Hasn't learned how to handle money, any of the sort of basic skills. And they'll say, well, we're thinking about it. And I said, no, in construction, you just got to get it done. It's affected how I think. And there's one of my drawings. Now, when you're a weird nerd, the way you sell yourself is to show off a portfolio. I'm a big proponent of making portfolios. And don't put too much junk in it. You want a 30-second wow. Now, I come back from the era of paper everything. So I'd have a couple of big fold-out drawings I would show people. I'd show them some photos, give them some trade magazine articles, and then my brochure. And there's the... Uh, the, the blueprints of the dipping vat project I did back in the early 70s. And this is a big project I worked on recently. It's two years ago. This is my center track restrainer system. If you want to see this thing work, you can look it up on Beef Plant Video Tour. I'm not going to show that tonight. But I worked on developing this equipment, and I like to show this uh, picture to parents. And I'm going, you know, stupid people don't do this kind of metal work. We need to start having some respect for this stuff. The Mars lander has just landed on Mars. Let's have some respect for the machine shops that built that. They don't get enough credit. And I get really annoyed when my department gets stuck down in the service tunnel with cable trays. You need the whole team. You know what I've found on building these big plants, and I've worked for every single major meat company that there is, the visual thinkers like me will lay out the whole entire plant. Also, the visual thinkers design a lot of the super clever mechanical engineering than the more traditional type of engineer. Yep, we need you. Boilers, refrigeration, pre-stressed concrete design, roof truss loading, power systems. Yep, we've got to have the whole team. But where we're losing out is a team that makes a lot of the clever kind of visual thinking mechanical engineering. Here's another picture there. I worked with a lot of people that were dyslexic. And you know what's happening? They can't replace them now. We no longer make the equipment for a big pork processing plant. I went in two of those last year. It comes out of Canada and out of Europe. And the reason we don't make them is because we've gotten rid of so many of our skilled trades courses. Some states are putting it back in. Infrastructure is falling apart in the U.S. I'm appalled at what some of the bridges look like. Now, at first, I thought everybody thought in pictures. 
And then one day I asked the speech therapist, think about a church steeple. How does it come into your mind? And I was shocked. She got this vague, generalized, pointy thing. For me, there's no pointy thing. There's only specific ones. There's specific ones that just flash up into my mind. So my knowledge of what a church steeple is, is based on a whole lot of specific examples. It's bottom-up thinking. And you've got to load a lot of data into the database so then I can start sorting the church steeples in the New England type, cathedrals, famous ones, and other categories. Now, brain scanning work now done 10 years ago show they have a big visual thinking circuit. And I want to discuss that we need to be uh, helping our visual thinkers. I'm very, very concerned that algebra requirements are screening these kids out. Yeah, if you want to do linear algebra for quantum computing, you need algebra. For a lot of stuff, you don't. And the kids are going to the basement to play video games instead of going out and fixing infrastructure or building the next Mars rover in the machine shop. They don't get credit. And one of the problems that a lot of brains that are different have is they're totally terrible with working memory. And right there is my trashed out working memory. Multitasking, can't do that. I never did pass algebra. So how did I get through college? It was a quirk in the educational system in 1967. In 1967, when I went to college, finite math was a required class. Probability, matrices, and statistics. Ton of tutoring, I got through it. And I limped through statistics with a C. You know, there was more to visualize, I could understand that. Well, when you have a working memory problem, if you have to do any task that involves sequence, you need to make a checklist. Step one, step two, step three. Make a pilot's checklist of the steps. This is one of my most important slides right here. The different kinds of minds. And there's science that backs this up. I am a photorealistic visual thinker. I think in photographic pictures. Can't do algebra. It's called an object visualizer, if you want the scientific name for it. Object visualizer. Then you have the pattern thinker. This is your visual spatial thinker. It's not the same as the object visualizer. Then you have your verbal facts guy, who's a very good at writing. Then you have auditory thinkers that are often dyslexic. We need visual thinkers. We need them to prevent messes like Fukushima. That was a huge visual thinking mistake. It's not a very good idea when you live next to the sea to put your super important emergency cooling pump in a non-waterproof basement. They didn't see the water fill in the basement. Watertight doors would have prevented it. This latest mess with Boeing. They came out with um, a plane that gets 10 to 12% more fuel economy, and, uh, but it made it more likely to stall. So they came out with a system that would automatically prevent stalls by shoving the nose forward. They forgot to tell the pilots that there was a change in how the controls work. On the old plane, you pull the yoke back, you pull the nose back up. This plane, this system gets activated, you pull the yoke back, it doesn't work. Whoops. Maybe in all that mathematical formulas, you didn't see any pilots. This is getting pretty basic. I've been following that really closely. And I don't think it's neglect, and I don't think it's ne negligence. They simply didn't see it. Yeah, we need the different kinds of minds. Now the lawyers have gotten into it, it's just ridiculous. But I think, I think originally it was a visual thinking mistake. They simply don't see it. And what's on the data recorders bad? Also, Lion Air was replacing important sensors with broken parts, and they're a really terrible airline. So they're responsible too for it. But there was a bad visual thinking mistake. Try different teaching methods with kids. School systems get way too hung up on just the same teaching methods. We need to be getting a lot more hands-on things back in the schools. Different ways to teach math. Just try different things. You want to find really cool things for school? Use the image function on Google to look up mathematical stuff. I'll give you another one. Quasi-crystalline graphene. Super cool. It's also super cool because it's all free. Well, that praying mantis was made out of a single sheet of folded paper. And what's in the background is the folding pattern. It's not my mind. There are some great little origami stars. And when I was a kid, I loved uh, making things with tools. You got kids growing up today 
that have never used tools. This is ridiculous. We've got kids growing up today that don't know how to hook up a garden hose. They're totally removed from the world of the practical. That's why I did my book, Calling All Minds, and we got plenty of them out there we're going to sell out later on. I'm a shameless book promoter. <laughs> yep, don't know how to hook up a garden hose. And then I talked to a guy who ran an oil rig, and he had to explain to a, to a guy what a garden hose was. <laughs> so how do I understand something abstract like the power and the glory in the Lord's Prayer? Well, here's my power and the glory, a rainbow with an electric tower at the base of the rainbow. And that picture is not photoshopped. I just took that. This is another important slide. All my thinking uses specific examples to create concepts. It's bottom up, not top down. And I was shocked to learn about two years ago that artificial intelligence works the same way. With bottom up thinking, like a program that's trained to diagnose melanoma. It's trained the same way that I learned about church steeples. Concepts are learned by putting specific examples into categories. This was a very trippy thing for me to learn. And here's a picture a young man sent me. These are old, old slides. And he's sorting cats and dogs into different categories. See, that's the bottom-up thinking. And the reason why we've got to get these kids out and get them doing stuff is you've got to fill the database up. You've got to fill it up. Get them out doing stuff. The more stuff you put in the database, the better they can think. And when I was in high school, I was called tape recorder because I always repeated the same words all the time. I got bullied all the time. And the only places I was not bullied was where I had friends who shared interests. Electronics, horseback riding, and model rockets. Get kids involved in shared interests. Use different methods of teaching math. You know, for me, to understand fractions, you cut the apple in half or into fourths, then I understood the fractions. Understand position words. Use several different specific examples to show you what down, up, in, and on mean. Now, I was more interested in looking at pictures of things than looking at pictures of people. But we need people that are interested in things. Friends through shared interests. Let's really encourage maker groups, all these kind of things like that. I showed horses in 4-H. Now, again, you sometimes have to do some activities you don't really like. One of the things that... Another, one of the things that helped a lot of grandparents to be successful in careers, even though they're on the spectrum, was old-fashioned 50s upbringing, teaching being on time, teaching turn-taking. Parents and teachers have got to work together as a team, not a temper tantrum. The rule was no howdy-doody show for one night. Teaching things like ordering food in restaurants. I'm finding smart, fully verbal teenagers that don't know how to order a hamburger at McDonald's by themselves. And some parents overprotecting and overaccommodating these kids. I talked to a mom recently, and I suggested that her 16-year-olds go in the office supply store and buy some paper. And mom started breaking down and crying, saying she couldn't let go. And I said, printer paper? <laughs> I, I, I'm not talking about doing anything really dangerous here. <laughs> they aren't learning the most basic stuff like that. Yep, you can be eccentric, that's just fine. The guy there with the long hair, he was a theater major before he went in to become the navigator for the Mars rover. Now, I had a lot of problems with anger. And what I had to do, I had to switch from anger to crying. And NASA space scientists cried when they shut down the space shuttle. Because if you throw things, NASA will fire you. And I like to categorize things, so I categorized all the world's rules into four categories. You have really bad things like robbing banks and burning down buildings and things like that, and you never should do that stuff. Then you have your courtesy rules. Then you have illegal but not bad. So how do you get out of the algebra requirement? That's in the illegal but not bad category. And if you're good at algebra, you can do quantum computing. You're going to need it for that. I know how to find the papers online for the parents. I don't understand them, but I know how to find them. And I'm finding that a lot of parents and teachers aren't very resourceful about looking stuff up online. And then the sins of the system don't mess with these dogs. They get you in a ton of problems. Teach the golden rule one specific example at a time. Let's say you found somebody's wallet. Make a point of making sure it gets given back. That's an example of one, I, one of the example of the golden rule. Also, in my generation, children were not exposed to so much nastiness out there in the media. 
You know, the, my heroes, Superman and Lone Ranger, they, they had good values. Now, when I got into puberty, I started having horrendous panic attacks, and I started using my squeezing machine. That calmed me down. Heavy exercise calmed me down. And I got the idea from this from a cattle squeeze chute. And you can see I did some carpentry work there. I've got an air-operated system on there, some good skilled trade stuff there. And I found out in another brain scan that my fear center was three times larger than normal. Yet my nervous system was in a constant state of fear. That is now controlled with a low dose of antidepressant medication. Here's two things I used to be afraid of, public speaking and airplanes. OK, this airplane that had this problem, the 737 MAX. And when I was talking to the techies, I got a rude new name for that plane, but I don't think we'll say it tonight. And uh, yep, I'll go on the MAX. The pilots know now. There's two switches you hit. I downloaded the FFA directive, Airworthiness Emergency Directive. I downloaded it. <laughs> and uh, there's some good gobbledygook in there. It said you could lose control of the airplane, a possible loss of altitude, and possible impact with terrain. That is the exact wording. And I'm, you know, I'm getting that plane. I'm flying on an airline tomorrow that's got 16 of them. And you know what their head pilot said in direct quote? They were really pissed at Boeing. This particular airline said that. We'll leave it at that. But I was afraid of airplanes. I was afraid of public speaking. I walked out of my first public speech in graduate school. You know what I learned? Have really good slides. So if you panic, Go back and read your slides. This is the plane I feared the most in college. It's got a really weird name. It's called a Fokker. You better say that very, very carefully. <laughs> it's called a Fokker. And air traffic control lots of times made a point of not saying it carefully. And this is the plane that made me get, a, um, get me interested in aviation. I got to ride in the cockpit of this plane that took a bunch of dairy cows down to Puerto Rico. I had to make airplanes become Interesting. Yeah, that's why I'm going to read about, you know, about impact, possible impact with water in this case. Yeah, not good. Fear is the main emotion in autism. My nervous system was in a constant state of, like, there were dangerous predators everywhere, even though there are no predators. It's now controlled with a low dose of antidepressants. And in my book, Thinking in Pictures, I describe my experiences. High doses of antidepressants, you'll get agitation and insomnia. I also talked to you about the different minds, like the object visualizer and the pattern thinker. In my book, The Autistic Brain, the science is in there. You know, you want science-based? I've got science-based for that. There's a rear view of the squeezing machine. <laughs> and pressure. Some people on the autism spectrum respond to pressure. Others don't. We're going to, we need to be sorting out the subtypes on the sensory issues. Because if you do a meta-analysis on this, it comes up with it doesn't work. But the problem is you're mixing apples and oranges together. Some kids respond to swinging, others don't. Some will respond to a weighted vest, others don't. But you're not talking about expensive things here. The squeeze machine's expensive, but this stuff here's not expensive. You can try it, and if it works, then try it, do it. Some of these kids don't want to be touched. You got little babies that don't want to be touched. There's a doctor down in, in Texas that if you've got babies that don't want to be touched, either they're autistic or maybe they've, you know, the mom got you know, exposed to drugs during pregnancy, she just has the parents buy one of those pouches and you just carry the kid around in it for four hours a day. It works. Simple, and it works. Elementary school life training. My mother had me be party hostess. I learned how to shop at a young age. My work experience, at 13, my mother got me a sewing job. It's important for these kids to be getting jobs outside the family. We can start with volunteer jobs, like church volunteer jobs, farmer's market. I was out on my aunt's ranch. At 15 years old, I ran my school's horse barn. I was learning how to work at a young age. I did three years in, in a school, and I didn't study at all. But I was learning how to work. And then my science teacher came along and got me interested in studying because now school is a path to a goal of becoming a scientist. I think more and more in education, we need to be looking at where is a student 10 years after high school? 10 years after high school, I had my master's degree and I was doing those dip fat projects. And one of the things that motivated me is I wanted to prove I wasn't stupid. 
we need to start showing what people with autism and other disabilities can do. I really liked what Stephen Hawking had to say right before he died. He said, concentrate on the things your disability doesn't prevent you from doing well. He could do math in his head, and he had a fabulous time in the weightless plane. He looked so happy. You can look that picture up online. And while I was in high school, I did lots of carpentry projects. And while I was getting my master's, I was doing sign painting projects. So I started out just doing freelance sign painting. That gradually morphed into cattle handling facilities. And I started out one little project at a time. We were having a discussion at dinner time about you know, how to make things more inclusive. You do it one project at a time. Okay, all the theaters around here are doing sensory friendly shows, that's great. Well then how about them hiring somebody on the spectrum? Let's do it one person at a time. Step by step, bottom up approach over a long period of time. And that's my sign painting truck. Learning to drive was hard. And one thing that helped me is on my aunt's ranch, it was three miles up to the mailbox on a dirt road and three miles back. So by the end of the summer, I had 200 miles on a dirt road. Go at it slowly, 20 minutes a day, big parking lots, backcountry roads, deserted office parks on the weekend, and have a much bigger period of practice. And there's now a journal article out that, that says the same thing. Walking dogs for the neighbors, fixing computers. We've got to get these kids learning how to work. Yes, academics is important. But if they don't know how to work, then after they graduate from college, they don't get a job. Uh, Legos are great, but let's progress to using tools. And there's one of my drawings right there. That was the drawing that I used to sell Cargill with in the late 80s. I sent the head of Cargill this drawing, and then I sent him this brochure. It's really important to have a brochure, to have a portfolio neatly presented, not too much junk in it. 30 second wow. And you can do this with art, you could do it with computer programming, you could do it with many different things. This was one of the pictures I put in the uh, portfolio. There's another picture. You know, and there's one of my designs in SketchUp. All lots of free classes online. You know, people need to get more resourceful about looking stuff up. And I really did make the Ames Optical Illusion Room, and my science teacher made me figure it out for myself. There's the movie crew. Lots of people on the spectrum on that movie crew. And how did they get those jobs? Because they got in the back door. They had a friend that was making some scenery come over and help. That's how you get in. Now, there's a scene in the HBO movie where I walk up to the editor of the Farmer Ranchman magazine, and I get his card. And I recognized that if I started writing for this farm magazine, that would help promote my jobs. You see, I saw that door. Writing skills were really important. I was a lousy student, but I had good writing skills. A lot of students today, writing skills are not very good. There's the plant where I started. And that's the plant where I took the drawings and walked around in there until I could look, make every line on the drawing match the real equipment. And I met the wife of the insurance agent while wearing this hand embroidered western shirt. I was wearing the portfolio. You never know when you're going to meet the person that can get you into something. I had great mentors, starting with my mother, great elementary school teachers, fantastic high school science teacher, Ann out at her ranch, and Jim, a really, really good contractor. Okay, I'm going to finish up now. I hope I haven't gone over the time. I just want to put my list of job slides up here. For people like me, industrial design. This is the art side of engineering. OK, let's talk about risk. Mathematicians and engineers calculate risk. Visual thinkers see risk. They didn't see the pilot frantically pulling back on the yoke that didn't work. They didn't see water filling the basement of Fukushima. And it was just on 60 Minutes last Sunday. They don't see it. We need both kinds of minds. Uh, auto mechanics, there's a very interesting um, article in News, uh, not Newsweek, Business Week, uh, called Marine Innovation Boot Camp, where they get a bunch of Marines and they've got to like make a device that will count trucks, make a vehicle out of a pile of junk. And what they found in this is that the truck mechanics were fabulous at this. The more 
mathematical degreed engineer, he didn't know where to start. You know, and on big projects, we're going to need the mathematical engineer. I can't design a jet airplane engine. But maybe I better be working on the risk analysis and the safety systems. And they're still trying to find that voice recorder for that plane. I hope they never find it. I can visualize what went on in that cockpit. Those families don't need to hear a plane scream. That needs to stay at the bottom of the ocean. They found the important one. That was the data recorder. That's got everything that they need on it. But I'm seeing that. Nobody needs to hear that. Um, photographer, animal trainer, architects. And here are the more mathematical jobs. Computer programmers, artificial intelligence. And I'm getting concerned about some of the things that computers would be controlling. I'm very concerned about hacking. And you have big expensive infrastructure. Substations, big generating plants. A very, uh, there was a gas explosion in Boston. It burned up like uh, six houses because they overpressurized gas lines to 10 times normal at the, main, at the end distribution point. I talked to a guy who worked for that company. He walked up to me and he says, it's scary who they're hiring. Fix this stuff. This is where we need our visual thinkers. If I've got to protect great big infrastructure from hacking, there's certain things that I don't think artificial intelligence should be controlling. If a piece of equipment gets too hot, it spins too fast, or it gets too much pressure, old-fashioned controls to shut her down. Shut it down. I've got to protect a power plant. I don't care that much about the power going off. But if you did something to a power plant that wrecked it, that's really a disaster. Big, expensive, difficult to replace infrastructure. No, I'm going to protect it with hacker-proof stuff. So I, can, I can visualize where I can put that stuff. Yeah, you think computers ought to be controlling everything. Yep, they flew a plane into the ocean about three weeks ago. And I think what happened is the engineers just didn't see that this thing get activated. Yeah, you had a broken sensor. Well, you got a half-broken sensor. It sort of worked, so it gave a wrong reading. And our verbal thinkers, one of the places they'd be really good is in sales and specialized retail. They really excel at that. Library jobs, counting. There's some low-level jobs here in accounting. AI is going to knock it out. Some bookkeeping stuff it will knock out. Uh, I've been watching this really closely, but I can tell you, skilled trades it won't knock out. And uh, we'll just leave these up here. Now, I think we're supposed to go into questions right now. I understand the chancellor's going to be doing some questions. And I'll leave the visual fingers up there. Thank you. Oh, maybe we can sleep in these chairs. Okay. <laughs> well, All right. that was really just fantastic. And I'm sure they uh, would like to hear more. But let me ask you a few questions, okay. including some from the audience. Okay. Uh, you seem to say technology is concerning, but yet it creates so many more opportunities. Well, it does. And I'm not so where, saying, where, I'm not do saying we it? don't do technology. What I'm saying is... There should have been a visual thinker at Boeing to say, hey, what about this pilot pulling back on this yoke? Yeah. Uh, we need to have a risk analysis. We need visual thinkers in that. We need especially developing safety systems. Uh, how could you not put watertight doors into Fukushima? It wouldn't have happened if they had watertight doors. Simple kind of stuff that, kind of stuff that we used to buy when I worked in construction. How much, let me ask you this question. As I see all of the things you did, and then you grew up in a very vast rural area, do you think that that was an advantage for you well, and learning more, make something, cut something, well, I build was, something? Well, I actually grew up in the suburbs of uh, uh, Boston. Okay. But in the 50s, we played in the woods. Yeah. We'd make things out of cardboard. We'd make costumes out of old sheets. Yeah. In the 50s, I mean, my generation, kids just made stuff. That's what all the, all the kids did. Yeah. And then I, I came, I got introduced to a dairy cattle at my boarding school when I was 14, introduced to beef cattle at 15 when I went to my aunt's ranch. Okay, and, so that's the connection. Yeah, at that's the ranch. where that started. Um, well, it was luck that that happened. My mother got remarried when I was 14, and that brought the ranch into the family. Does that, does that play an important part in 
all those the skills you developed, do you think? Well, or, like a lot, of the well on that way? a lot of the carpentry and building stuff, I already knew how to do you that. Knew how I knew to how do to that. do that. Yeah. But it got me into the beef cattle industry. And the hardest thing for me in the early 70s was being a woman. Oh, that was 10 times worse than the autism. And uh. they really did put <laughs> bull testicles on my car. Yeah. <laughs> and I had to be three times better than a guy. I, I had to make myself work really, really hard, and it wasn't easy to make myself really good at what I did. Yeah. You talked about the connections to people at work and don't do interviews. How do the big employers, though, become better at welcoming Well, the way I did an interview is I just laid the portfolio out on the table. Yeah. Drawings, and I learned not to, neatly presented. I made the mistake one time of letting my portfolio get kind of ripped up and shabby. It would be two freshly printed, big fold-out drawings, about 15 pictures. I had trade magazine articles to give to everybody. My brochures, basically a wow. Uh, you know, now today I've got stuff up on you know websites. Uh, it's showing the work. Also, we got to start working on finding back doors. The short circuit, some of this stuff. So many jobs have just gotten through connections. And I think mm -hmm. that scene in the movie where I get the card from the editor, that scene is true, and that's really important. I saw that as a door. If I could start writing for that magazine, that would re really help. And then I wrote for the national magazines, and I did that big project, and then I wrote about it. And that brought more jobs. Now, some people... In, on this campus, including, are working on so-called cures and treatments. But you're talking so convincingly to me and others about neurodiversity. How do you react to people who are doing the, the kind of what we call cure research? And what should well, they the be doing? Well, the problem that you got is, is you got such a big spectrum. You see, yeah. I think on the milder end, it's just part of normal variation. Yeah. Because they're finding similar variations in animals, and then solitary mammals is a model for autism. I'm going to ask, okay, panthers are more solitary. Panthers abnormal. Yeah. You know, then you get into very, very severe cases, and there's a lot of very severe cases where they have other medical problems on top of the autism. And then working on some of these sensory issues, these, these can be really debilitating. Mm -hmm. My top area for research would be to work on sound sensitivity. That's the worst one when it comes to people not being able to uh, do things. Hmm. Uh, you talked about without neurodiversity, we wouldn't have NASA. Let's put it that way. Well, we wouldn't even have electricity. Tesla right. invented. <laughs> okay. So, Tesla was on the spectrum. Right. So is this something that, even going back further, that we have selected for? Because going back to the most early times of humans, who do you this think was made a the big first, advantage. Who do you think made the first stone spear? It wasn't the yakety yaks around the campfire. <laughs> Well, let, let's. Let. Well, you see, you see, in the milder variations, it's part of, of variation. Right. You know, the, one of the things we've learned in animal behavior is if you overselect for an animal behavior trait, you look at Belyev's foxes when they selected for gentleness, turned into a stocky black and white border collie fox, and then they went overboard on it and they got epilepsy. Mm -hmm. You can get that. I talked to somebody. The, about five years ago, we had to retire two yellow lab guide dogs because they got seizures at age four. I talked to somebody else who was breeding German shepherds for you know police work, and the dog, uh, when it got mature, started just biting for no reason. I think that it could be a psychomotor epilepsy. You overselect for behavior trait mm -hmm. in animals, you get trouble. D did the drawings are remarkable? You're a true artist. Do you ever? Just draw or paint for, I'm just going to draw. I'm not doing as much drawing now. Right now I'm doing my talks. I mean, I kind of feel now I'm so concerned that there's so many smart kids are ending up in the basement. What I'm saying, one of the reasons why I'm so down on the video game stuff is they're not going into the video game industry. They're not going into programming. 
What I'm seeing with these smart autistic kids is kind of two roots, hole up in the room, video games or something else, or learn how to work, get out and have a career, go get you know, a job they really like. I worked with so many geeks and nerds that were dyslexic, they were ADHD, they were the bad boy that's now labeled oppositional defiant, mm -hmm. that were turned around by the shop teacher. And fortunately, some of these hands-on things are being put back in the schools. And let's look at stuff that AI can re replace. It's not going to replace theater, but it's going to replace the oncologist, the endocrinologist, and the dermatologist. They're going to get replaced. People are still going to want live theater. Mm -hmm. That's a good career. Yeah. I listen. And so is I, I could listen. Somebody's I, gotta, I agree with somebody's you. Somebody's got to fix those self-driving cars. We're still going to need mechanics. Yeah. Did music ever play a significant role in your life, or have you seen in your experience and research music playing oh, a significant music, role? Oh, music, for some people, that music is where they excel. See, the thing about the autistic brain is it's uneven skills. Good at one thing, terrible at something else. So some tend to go the verbal writing route, oh. some kind of a music and math route. I'm more the art, you know, the art route. And they can also be mixtures, but the uneven skills is really, really common. Now, I have um, a question here that you obviously experienced, you talked about it with the social aspects of teenage life. Oh, and what, worst part of my life. What, what, <laughs> yeah, I think many would agree with you, but what, <laughs> what, what, what would you tell a family, if you sat with them and said, well, here's I'm, how you can get through the teenage well, years. Well, there's some, let's talk about it. You know, the, the kid goes to big high school, and I'll have one mom say, oh, he's in band and theater and doing just great. Then another kid's getting bullied to death. I was one of the kids that had to be taken out of a big high school. It didn't work for me. And, then, and when I went away to this boarding school for kids with problems, I basically ran their horse barn for three years. Now, they made me attend classes. They made me attend meals. Recluse in the room, that they weren't going to allow. Hmm. That's one place they drew a line in the sand. But I learned how to work running that horse barn. And big problem I'm seeing now, I'm seeing kids that are straight A academic students go out in the workplace and they just are not successful in the workplace. Right. You see, what we want to do is have a slow transition. The trick to transitions is to do it slowly. Okay, let's say you have a, a kid that's in here right now. He comes in as a freshman. I want to see him maybe start with a campus job, and then I want some jobs off campus because I want him to learn how to work before he graduates because I, there's so many of them, they excel at academics, and they lose it in the workplace, and they end up in the basement. Mm -hmm. And this is something I don't want to see happen. What um, your work on animals is so important to your story and we're discovering more and more about animal cognition and animals with languages and animals making tools is do you think the animals are passing what we think of are they better than humans or well animals are, i mean when somebody was saying animals don't have emotions which is totally ridiculous that's not true uh, that's totally ridiculous i mean they pant skip seven emotional systems i really like those kind of imagine them on a music mixing board high or low fear there's genetic components there's environmental components uh, seeking one labrador retrievers frisky and chases the ball the other one's heavy set makes a great service dog kind of lazy that makes a really good um service dog when I look at the whole animal, you know, the big main difference between us and animals is the size of the cortex. We have a gigantic computer sitting up here that they don't have. Uh, dogs are not going to fly to the moon anytime soon or, um, or make computers. Mm -hmm. That's the main, the main difference. Emotions are not the main difference. Right. What uh, advice do you have for a parent sending a child off to college or for universities? You said starting them with some work as they're heading to go to well, college. Well, some kids are going to have a lot of problems with being away from home. Mm. Being in a boarding school, I, that in some ways helped me. I still had a lot of social issues. There was still bullying when I was at college. 
And the thing that stopped it is in my junior year, I won in a big variety show they had at my college. And then I got in, that was a shared interest. Friends through shared interests. It could be a robotics club. It could be the being in theater and going in shows that are put on here. Friends who shared interests, super, super important. Um, I think there's some students where maybe need to go more slowly. You know, they uh, uh, maybe not take a full load. You know, maybe take five years to, you know, do the degree. Mm -hmm. We've got to start looking at, I really like this idea, where is a student 10 years after high school? When I was 10 years after high school, I had just finished my master's and I was doing those dip fat projects. What, uh, what is the biggest change in the world since when you grew up? Well, the biggest change, I think, is in, in my generation, in the 50s, kids were taught social rules in a much more structured way, all kids. And I think that's one of the reasons why grandmother and granddaddy that find out, you know, they may be 60 years old and they find out they're on the autism spectrum, the more rigid social training really helped them. Also, values were clearer. You didn't have grown-ups behaving badly on television. There was very clear things about, you know, good and bad. Uh, that's stuff that influenced me. Roy Rogers' Rules for Living. They're really good rules for living. You can look them up online. <laughs> this is the sort of stuff that you know, was brought up with in the, in the 50s. And you sat down and you had table manners. And if I put, let's say I put my hand in that water and I stirred it, my mother would say, use the spoon. She wouldn't scream, no, you'd give the instruction. That was typical 50s upbringing. And, and that helps a person that doesn't learn social by instinct. Mm -hmm. It was taught in a more structured way to little children. Turn taking, really super important. Pounded into me with board games. And then when I got older, um, yeah, sometimes the other rest of the family wanted to do an activity I didn't like, but I had to do it and not disrupt it. Now, uh, is the technology, though, a big change? Oh, to Silicon you? Valley practically bans the screens. Nope, they control the screens. Um, uh, Steve Jobs didn't let his kid have an iPad. I'm saying we need to limit the game playing because they're getting addicted to it. Oh. And they're not having good outcomes. And any benefit you could get, let's say, learn how to fly an airplane with a video game, you don't learn that from eight hours a day of doing it. Yeah. Maybe an hour a day, two hours a day doing it. Yeah. You know, any benefit you're going to have from that, you don't get it from eight hours in the basement. Yeah. So, uh, but you think that some of the areas of artificial intelligence and machine learning, and those are areas, pattern recognition, and the interaction between human and machine is an area where the neurodiversity can really be talented. Yeah, that's developed. right. And they're the ones that are going to make those systems. And when I started reading how AI works, I go, it's the autistic brain. Mm -hmm. Like a medical diagnosis program, that's pure bottom-up thinking. Yeah. When I read that article in Nature, you know, it's about a year and a half ago. I got that article and I go, wow, that's exactly how I think. Yeah. Do you think that one of the biggest impacts you have is to talk about the different learning styles? I think it's important, and there's science to back up when I talk about the object visualizer who thinks in photorealistic pictures and the more pattern visual spatial. There is science, and, and I've got references in my autistic brain book, and I've looked up other papers since then. You use keywords object visualizer and visual spatial. Those are the key words you use to find it on Google Scholar. Right. Do you think that our K through 12 education system is starting to incorporate that Some, or is it too, what, admin, what, what's that element, administratium? Administratium or? is a newly discovered element added yeah. to the periodic table of the elements yeah. and has an astronomically it, high atomic weight. I did not And make it's inert. It, <laughs> it's it inert. reacts with absolutely nothing because it's inert. Nert, yeah. <laughs> and, is that and the problem in K through 12? You know where I got that from originally? When I first came to CSU, administratium was put on my door and it was stamped by our provost. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I did not make up administratium. Yeah. You can look it up online and there's big long explanations that are even really funny to read the big long ex explanation. Yeah. But does that interfere with our ability to start earlier with 
how do kids learn and what are the different learning styles? Do well, we see? need to be doing a lot. I went to school we have in Fort Collins um, uh, that has a whole lot of hands-on learning and the kids are doing uh, somewhat better than the state average on the standardized tests and they're not just drilling them to the test. And what I'm seeing in education is I think the verbal learners are totally taking over. Yeah. I recently went to STEM um, meeting. I think I'll say, I'm not going to say where it was. I'm not going to be very complimentary what I have to say about it. I went to a gifted meeting and it was all verbal thinkers. I, okay, where are the mathematicians? Where are the, um, the art kind of minds? And these are recent meetings that within the last six months. Yeah. And we'll leave the state out of it where I went. Yeah. Well, that's, that's, dis that's uh, very, very interesting because there's so much emphasis on STEM and quantitative that I feel like we are pushing too much of the theater and art Where we and need music the, away. We need the theater kids. We need the art kids because an art mind would have seen that pilot pulling back on mm -hmm. that yoke. Yeah. That data recorder is horrible. 20 yeah. times he tried to pull it back. Yeah. And then he gave it to the co-pilot and then the plane crashed then. When the controls were switched over, it's all on the data recorder. It's, they had a, the state-of-the-art super data recorder. And it had four flights on it, plus the three screwed-up flights yeah. before that one where they managed to fly that plane without crashing it. Yeah. Or painted the shoreline of Fukushima and visualized... Well, I can visualize the water fill in the basement. Yeah. And then you've got... I, I just saw the um, uh, pictures inside Fukushima that they showed on 60 Minutes just last Sunday... And big electric panels in there? Yeah. This stuff doesn't run underwater. Yeah. You know, it doesn't matter whether it's in a meat plant or it's in a nuclear power plant. Stuff doesn't work underwater. Yeah. And I honestly and truly think they don't see the water going in there. Yeah. Watertight doors, and then I want a sump pump in there, too, because they're going to leak a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you could... So, on... Let me ask you uh, this last question about the cloud and everything is computed at a distance or everything's being controlled by the cloud. You I want to tell you what I like to do to young people. I like to ask them what the cloud is. Yeah. And I say, where do the movies live in the cloud? And some people will say something about you know server computers, but then they'll say things like in the satellite, in the cell phone tower. I go, really? They keep all the movies in that little box that's at the base of the cell phone tower? <laughs> Let me show you the cloud. And I'll get aerial pictures of uh, data centers. And I said, this is the cloud. Yeah. Huge warehouses full of computers. I've shown that to teenagers and college students, and some of them are just flabbergasted when I, when I show them what the cloud is. That's when I want to have some fun. I do that. Really? <laughs> Tell me... Um, how does your visualization or the skills and talents of neurodiversity, does it play a role? I mean, obviously in risk analysis, like is there a pilot there? What does the pilot do? But, what but about even in just designing systems, why would you be doing something that changes the basic control of an airplane? Yeah. When you're advertising that airplane that a 737 pilot can fly it with very little additional training. Why would you change how the yoke works? Yeah. You know, to a visual thinker that's so basic, why would you do that? Are things like global warming and the visualization let me of tell you catastrophe? Let me, just, let me just tell you a thing I visualized as a little kid. When I was in about fourth grade, my teacher explained how the Earth's atmosphere, if the Earth was the size of an apple, the atmosphere was the thickness of the skin. I never forgot that little lecture. And we were out in a picnic. A big power plant was blasting smoke into the air. And I said to my mother, well, isn't that going to make the air dirty? And I visualized the atmosphere being thin. And mother says, oh, well, it just disappears. I was right. It did make it dirty. That well, was about fourth grade that I... Well, Temple, we've talked about visualization, but you are a visionary, and you are a gift to humanity. And I want to thank you for being here with us and thank you for participating in so many activities and giving 
great inspiration to well, all of us. Well, and I want to make sure we got to we got to help our visual thinkers. I'm seeing too many visual thinkers totally getting screened out. And yep, quantum computing you need algebra. Uh, never got a chance to try geometry, but I'm concerned that we're screening out visual thinkers that we need. We need them. Cool. Maybe we'll just end it on that. Thank you. All right, thank you. <laughs> You're great.